teaching class. Technical seminars are an Intertech production. For instructorlet.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com. All right, so getting close to the end here, you know, through the demo that I just was giving, I kind of broke down a lot of this already, so I'm not going to bother to repeat myself. There's a couple of other pieces here, too, that I would talk about at much more length in the real class, but every assembly has a couple of other things, too. It's not just the SIL code. Assemblies contain something called a manifest, and that's actually important information. Um, this is how the CLR will understand where it has to go to find things. For example, dot assembly extern. This little area says, well, this application is using MS Core Live. It wants this version of MS Core Live. And then this guy right here, this public key token, this is kind of a um, green light that tells the CLR this library could be inside of the GAC. In fact, if I were to go open up the GAC window, which I think I have open still, go to MS Core Live version 2. That's pretty hard to see those numbers, but if you take a kind of squint your eyes there, this number that we see highlighted is the same number that we see listed right here. So that's actually useful information. And we can actually control that to some degree, too, through XML configuration files. And then assemblies also have metadata. You know, like when we're in Visual Studio and we apply the dot operator, and we see IntelliSense pop up? Well, that's because Visual Studio is reading metadata. Now, you might think to yourself that metadata is this really academic topic that no one would care about in a business application. Not true. Metadata is a key service that you'll use all the time. If you're doing Windows Communication Foundation, if you're building custom WPF controls, then metadata is a really important part of your puzzle. Now, thankfully, we don't have to worry about this low-level format, but there is a whole namespace called Reflection, which allows us to discover metadata at runtime. And there's also a way to inject custom metadata into an assembly using something called attributes. Again, we're not going to get into all that here, but uh, those are also topics that we talk about in the full class. So here's the, the final things I want to leave you guys with. When I was writing my very simple code for the demos, I was using C Sharp. That's not the only language that I could have picked, though. When you do an install of the .NET framework, you actually get a collection of different languages. Now, there's a really great website out here that I want to show you. i got my browser up over here. www.netlanguages.net. i just uh, make that a little bigger in case you want to jot that down. This is a website that kind of gives a running tally of all the known .NET languages. So if you were to just go right here, .NET languages.net, and I'll put that back up in a second if you want to write it down. You could then click on this resources tab. That's where I am right now. And then you see a list of all these different .NET languages. So there's COBOL like I was talking about, actually a couple of different COBOLs. Right? We have Java Bridges, we have different flavors of Lisp, we got Perl, we got Prolog, we got Smalltalk. <laughs> you know, pretty much if there's a language you want to use, there's a .NET compiler for it. So Iron Ruby. Oh, I don't want to do this. Oh. Decommissioned. Wow, what do you think about that? Oh, I have to go to the cloud. Oh, we're not going to go to the cloud right now. Let's go ahead and get rid of that. Go back here. See, that's the risk of any kind of live demo, right? <laughs> Let me try a different one here. Let's go to 
one I've actually played around with before. S sharp. That one's down too. Well, I'm 0 for 2. How about uh, small talk? There we go. So here's an S sharp derivative called sharp small talk. Now, a lot of these different compilers are completely free. Some of them come for a cost, right? But the cool thing to remember here is that all of these different languages, they're working on the same, look at that, A sharp got moved too, boy. All of these different languages, I know booze should be there, is they're all operating on the same exact common type system and they all execute under the same CLR. So this is a really clean way to have some pretty advanced interop between different language systems. So again, that website, www.netlanguages.net. And then the real final thing I want to talk about, this just kind of goes through the, the core languages that Microsoft gives us, is right here. As I mentioned earlier, the Microsoft.NET framework is not the only .NET framework out there. Remember what Microsoft did. They submitted to ECMA these two key specifications, 33.4 and 33.5. And these allow you to uh, see all the dirty details on the syntax of SIL code, of C sharp code, all the core libraries, how the runtime works, all that you know, low-level stuff. The reason it's interesting to us is that this opens up the possibility for other corporations or open source you know, vendors to build up their own implementation of the platform. And by far and away, the most popular alternative to Microsoft.net is called Mono. I have that website open too. Or I have that website open. There it is. Okay. Now, Mono is actually sponsored by Novell. So, even though this is a completely free, open source, cross platform framework, it actually has some funding, right? So, if I were to come over here to the download link, okay, look at all these different operating systems that Mono can run on. Ironically, it can run on Windows. So you could build your .NET applications without ever installing Microsoft.NET. Now, of course, when you use Microsoft.NET, you're going to get the best experience for Windows. But if you use Mono, you're going to get a really great experience across a variety of operating systems like Mac, right? SUSE, Solaris. A couple of other cool things to notice here about the Mono website. And that's just at, I'll put that little link up here for you too. It's just monoproject.com, dash project, mono-project.com. They actually have their own IDE called Mono Develop. And that's sort of like their version of Visual Studio. It's actually quite good. They also have their own implementation of, so there's a screenshot of Mono Develop. They have their own implementation of Silverlight called Moonlight. And that would work on Linux-based operating systems as well. Right? And they even have a .NET framework for programming iPhone devices and iPods and so forth. All right, so that is all I wanted to say in my little spiel today. Remember, this is just kind of a shortened version of the first chapter of the complete C-sharp class. What I tried to do here was just set the stage. Right? We learned about a couple of interesting aspects of working with the platform. Talked about things like the common type system. Talked about the CLS. Remember, that's that subset. We talked about the CLR from a high level. We learned what the term assembly means and how assemblies contain SIL code. And we talked about a couple of different tools that we can use during the development process, such as Reflector and ILDASM and Visual Studio. So I want to say thank you for uh, logging on and listening to me yammer here for a little while. Hopefully we'll see you in class someday. So take care, everybody. 
And I'll do one final thing. Let me put up my email address. So those are those two websites. If you have any questions for me, again, my name's Andrew Carlson. I really can't type. There you go. So you just contact me here at atrolson at intertech.com and I'll be happy to point you in the right direction. Try to answer any questions you might have. So thanks again, everybody. For more free learning resources and to see the latest lineup of our instructor-led .NET, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com.